Welcome uh, viewers to the sixth lecture of the series spur and helical gear cutting. So, last time when we met we were discussing a question uh, this was that a student is developing a setup in which he intends to rotate a fan at 8640 rpm from a motor rotating at 1440 rpm. He has the following gears with him which are the ones that he should employ in a gearbox which has only two shafts with center distance of 120 millimeters okay 120 millimeters center distance okay so uh, we discussed a possible configuration in which the motor is rotating here and there are two gears which are reducing uh, increasing the rpm in this auxiliary shaft these two gears are sharing the rpm <coughs> and this is finally giving it to another gear which is loosely fitted on this shaft and connected to the fan so that the ultimately the fan rotates at the required rpm what sort of increase is there so if you uh, divide the initial rpm sorry if you divide the uh, rpm uh, let's uh, work it out on the piece of paper 8640 rpm by 1440 rpm i think offhand i if you, if you calculate you will find 6 4s are 24 6 times increase of rpm is required and as shown in the figure it has been the it has been provided that we should try to achieve it in two steps now this is 2 into 3 so, let us have a multiplication of the rpm 2 times and then the multiplication in 3 times, but should we first do 3 and then 2 or then 2 and then 3 or does it does it really matter if I am doing 2 first and 3 next etcetera. Generally what happens is if you have 3 shafts if you had had 3 shafts okay here also basically we are having 3 shafts if you have say the general case of 3 shafts and say you are bringing down the rpm okay the rule is generally do the first reduction okay as the smaller ratio and then do the next reduction that means if you have to get say if, if you are working at 1440 rpm and from there if you have to reach say uh, how much uh, let us divide this by 10 so this becomes 144 rpm if it is to be uh, reached so it is 2 into 5 so, it is better to have 5 reduction here of course, 5 reduction is extremely difficult in one stage hypothetically let us say if you want to reduce the speed by a factor of 5 here and by a factor of 2 here it is good because the intermediate shaft will be rotating at a high rpm in that case 8 sorry 7 20 rpm less is the rpm more is the torque and therefore, more is the diameter of the shaft in order to withstand that, tor that torque that is a problem because you would have to spend more money for making the shaft because it will be more robust in size. Had you had 5 reduction 5 times reduction here the rpm would have been less than 720 and you would have had to employ a much larger diameter shaft in order to withstand the torque which would have appeared here. So, the rule in sliding clusters is that have smaller reductions first and larger reductions as close as possible to the final stage. In this case however, we are making the rpm higher and higher. So, initially we are rotating at smaller rpms and then we are going for higher rpms. So, higher the rpm less is the torque and therefore, we let us have this one first okay, 
let us have this one first. So, that when we are in the shaft number 2, we are having a much higher RPM, it has to withstand less torque. And therefore, let us have a reduction of 3 first and then a reduction of 2. If you now go back to the problem and look at the uh, let us let us look at the computer screen and look at the values. Can we have a uh, look at the computer screen please? So, if you look at the values of the spur gears uh, number of numbers of teeth available in that case spur gear of module 2 is provided and let us see whether they have a number of teeth which is uh, 1 is to 3 yes 30 and 90, but will they fit in 120 millimeters center distance ok. Their diameters are so z is equal to 30 diameter equal to 2 into 30 equal to 60 millimeters and radius is equal to 30 millimeters and z is equal to 90 naturally we can pass all these we can say radius will be equal to naturally 3 times of this how much is that it will be 90 millimeters this one when added together will give us 120 millimeters center distance. So, this is quite satisfactory we can use 30 uh, teeth gear with 90 teeth gear and achieve 1 is to 3 uh, 3 is to 1 speed increase and therefore, we can also use z is equal to 40 and z is equal to 80 where combined they will give radii of you know uh, this diameter will be equal to 2 into 40 equal to 80 millimeters. Therefore, radius will be equal to 40 millimeters and this lower radi I mean the radius of the larger one naturally will be 80 and therefore, this will be adding up to 120 millimeters center distance that is also this can be used. So, we will use 30 and 90 gear and we will use 40 and 80 gear and that way the RPM will be uh, you know increased to 6 times its previous value. So, let us have a look at the figure once again this one will be 90 teeth, 30 teeth, 40 teeth sorry 80 teeth, 40 teeth and therefore, the fan will be rotating at the required speed. Okay. So, after this I had another problem which we will discuss later on let us formally start the sixth lecture. The question which we have left behind I will definitely provide the discussion and answer to you in subsequent lectures. Milling of spur and helical gears. So, what do we do in case of milling of spur and helical gears? First of all we have a milling machine we carry out milling operation and there is a, a specific type of cutter or rather cutters and we take a blank which is generally a disc shaped uh, I mean a, a cylinder with a certain amount of thickness which is equal to the width of the gear and we cut away certain portions from this blank. So, that the teeth remain the, the material which is there uh, 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 on the tooth spaces that is removed and only the teeth remain. So, cutting off of some material is required. If you have a look at this particular figure this is how it is done. This is the original uh, blank ok this is the blank which means the material from which we are going to cut out some extra material. So, that only that which is required remains what is required these are the teeth which are required.
this is what is required. So, there is some material which is not required which is which can be quickly identified as this part. This has to be removed and it is on the milling machine that we do the removal of these you know tooth space material. So, if this has to be done what do we have as the machine as the cutter etcetera etcetera. Let us go through them one by one. First of all the machine is typically a horizontal column and knee type universal milling machine, but other configurations are also possible. There are many other configurations like fixed bed type okay, uh, then uh, vertical uh, milling machine, omniversal milling machine so many are there, but the one that we have identified here this will serve its purpose quite well for both spur gears and helical gears. Okay. So, let us move through them one by one. Horizontal milling machine, horizontal milling machine means where the cutter axis, cutter rotational axis is horizontal. Okay. So, this identifies basically the configuration of the cutter in space, its axis of rotation is horizontal. Okay. Uh, will vertical uh, milling machine do? Yes, you can set it up that way, but this one, this combination of all these uh, you know specifications that is definitely going to serve the purpose. Column and knee type, column and knee type is basically referring to the structure of the milling machine, where there is an upright or vertical column which supports the table on which you are putting the job and that also contains the vertical screw which can be uh, you know utilized to make the cutter uh, table move up and down. Let us have a quick look at that. This is your table. sorry this, this is your table and you, you will have a column sort of thing, say let us draw it this way, and here you will have a device to you know house all the mechanisms. So, uh, not a very good depiction let me draw it a fresh table and there is one vertical screw provision for a vertical screw. Okay. And this vertical screw is supported here and this one uh, there is a provision to have a nut here which makes the table move up and down. Okay. So, this whole thing when seen from the side looks like this. table and screw and it can move on the milling machine up and down. But what is the column that we are talking about? This is the column. Okay. So, sorry, this is the column this is the table and this is called the knee and the cutter can be supported on a shaft column arbor this is the cutter and you have the milling machine. Cutter is rotating by the rotation of this particular shaft and you can put your job here your work piece. 
if you want to move the work piece down, this vertical screw can operate and this whole thing can come down. And this column and knee type uh, structure allows the operator to interact with the machine very easily. It is an open type of structure. You want to move the job up, move this up. You want to move the job down, move this down. You can move it longitudinally in a horizontal plane. You can move it transverse on a horizontal plane. This is extremely accessible. So, for manually operated machines, this column and knee type configuration is extremely easy to operate. So, for the machine, this is the case. And what about universal machine? For universal machines, a rotation about the vertical axis is possible. You can rotate the table about a vertical axis. This is the vertical axis. The table can be rotated this way. This is extremely useful for cutting of helical gears. Okay. Okay. Now, the cutter, how does the cutter look like? The cutter looks like I want to cut off this portion. So, the cutter exactly conforms to this particular shape. Rather, let us use a different color. This is the cutter. So, it looks like this. In what way? This is its axis of rotation. Okay, it might not move right up to this portion because there will be teeth like this. Why have I given no section line here? Actually, here also there will be no section line because they, you might be uh, cutting only the body portion, not the teeth. How do the teeth look like? So, this is one uh, view of it. The teeth would be looking like this. Okay. So, this is the basic body on that these would be the teeth. No space to accommodate that. Okay, fine. So, this is the cutter, it rotates this way and removes material. So, this is one view and this is the other view. So, from the side, it looks like this, I mean, from the end, it looks like this, it rotates this way, and from the other side, it looks like this, it rotates this way, it has a hole inside and there is one keyhole, keyway. What is the advantage of this cutter? It is doing a, 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 just a copying, okay. copying a form which is already made on it. This is exactly conforming to the gap which is to be cut here. Somebody has already done it for you. This sort of complex involute profile has been, you know, machined on it when it has been made. On the other side, we can see the teeth here. What is this one? It is slightly moving away from the circle along an Archimedean spiral to provide clearance and the rake angle can be say 90 degrees. So, on this side, we have the rake angle and on this side, we have the clearance angle. Okay. An Archimedean spiral ensures that the clearance angle will more or less remain constant. If it is logarithmic spiral, it will be absolutely uh, you know, retained, the clearance angle. Anyway, 
So, this one will be rotating and here it will be rotating this way and removing all this material. So, once this has been done, it is removed, this one is rotated so that the next material to be removed, this part, this one comes here and again the cutter is used to you know pass through while rotating and remove this particular material. This is what is done in case of milling. You have the job this way, the cutter goes through, cuts the material, you rotate the job, cutter comes, cuts the material, you again rotate the job like that. So, it is simply cut, rotate, cut, rotate, cut, rotate like that. This process of rotation is called indexing. So, let us have a quick look at other aspects of the cutter, the machine and other attachments. So, this sort of cutter is known as rotary disc type form milling cutter. It rotates, it is shaped like a disc and it has a form Im, uh, imparted on it which it will be reproducing on the uh, blank in order to form the gear. However, n milling cutters are also possible. The n milling cutter you know will be uh, cutting this way. Let me draw a figure to show you. Have a look please. This is the end milling cutter. Okay, it rotates this way and removes material. It is not as popular as the other configuration of rotary disc type form milling cutter. Okay, now, so we have discussed almost everything about the cutter, it is uh, as we discussed it is a form milling cutter. So, it is it falls under the category of form relieved cutters where the uh, sharpening is done on the rake surface, never on the clearance surface because the clearance surface is having a definite form, it cannot be disturbed and uh, what do you call it, the material uh, only the material of cutter has not been discussed, it is it can be made of high speed steel, it can be made of carbides etcetera cutter number we will take up a little later. Now, about an attachment which is extremely essential for the milling operation to be carried out. Okay. Please look at this particular figure. We will come to this figure a little later. First, let me try to explain on this you know hand drawn figure why this attachment is required. If you look at this particular gear, If I have to remove this material in order to create teeth, in that case after this has been cut, I have to give it a rotation of this much. I am here, I have to give a rotation up till this point. How do I give that? So, let us do some calculations to find out how much is ro this rotation is supposed to be. So, once again let us take some specifications say module equal to 2, number of teeth equal to say 72. Okay. In that case the rotation should move the gear by an angle 2 pi by 72. This is the angle to be uh, to be rotated through. Basically, it corresponds to 1 by this these many 
radians equal to it corresponds to 1 by 70 second of a rotation 1 by 70 second of a rotation. So, how do I do that? Well, the easiest thing would be let us have uh, some some sort of a dial made. Suppose you go to the uh, you know nearby watch shop, watch repair and watch new watch selling and ask them do you have the dial of a watch okay, available as a piece of paper. They will say yes, but what do you want to do with that? Well, you have your own plans, you buy it okay, and you paste it on the blank. So, this is your blank and this is your watch dial, you have pasted it and then you have a marker or a small marking needle and you put it on some fixed object. Once one tooth has been cut, this tooth has been cut, that is very good. What do you do? You have to cut 72 teeth. So, in order to cut 72 teeth, you understand 360 is one rotation divided by 72 means how much? 36 goes into 72, how many times? Twice. So, 36, 72 they cancel out, you have 10 above and you have 2 in the denominator, so that you have 5 degrees. So, for each tooth to be cut, a 5 degree rotation is required between 2 cuts. You cut one tooth, then you rotate it by 5 degrees, you can be able to cut another tooth. This is the basic idea. Just 5 degrees you might be asking yourself, but mind you, the diameter of the job is m into z equal to 2 into 72 and that makes it 144 millimeters. On top of that add 4 millimeters for the outer diameter and it is really 148 millimeters outer diameter quite large okay, about, about, about this much, this much diameter. So, on that 5 degrees rotation would be a substantial amount of circumferential movement and therefore, 5 degrees is no problem. You start from here, you will be counting okay, 1 degree, 2 degree, 3 degree, 4 degree, 5 degree, if these are you know uh, representing degrees. So, for, from here to here rotations would be given. So, you will say that is it. I have solved the whole problem of milling. Just have a, a dial like this fixed up, loosen the bolts which are holding it in place for cutting, move by 5 degrees on that watch dial and clamp it once again and cut. There is one problem. Life will not always be so smooth, it might end up in a you know very uh, difficult uh, to handle fraction and secondly whenever you are moving like this without vernier without anything okay it's difficult to control the manual errors that you will always be you know always be uh, making because you you'll be making i estimations you will be making uh, parallax error due to I estimations, you might be, uh, so uh, might, might be going for uh, backlash error, all these things errors are there. So, it is very difficult to handle these things, but if you have a mechanism of you know reducing this error, you will be in a much better position. So, what we do is we have a device which 
can rotate this, I can rotate this blank, but from a source where a huge amount of rotation will be giving rise to just one rotation of this blank. So, I will have more control. If you ask me to move by 1 degree, which is difficult or say 0.5 degree, which is difficult, instead on that initial uh, rotating uh, object, okay, uh, rotation, uh, rotational handle or crank, I will give 20 rotations, so that those 20 rotations will correspond to maybe half a rotation here. So, if you want to move very small divisions, small uh, angular uh, distances, I will actually convert it from a large angular distance where my percentage errors will be much less. Suppose, I am always making an error of uh, half a degree everywhere or say uh, not half a degree, half a degree is quite high, say uh, 1 minute. 1 degree equal to 60 minute equal to uh, 16 to 60 seconds. So, suppose I am always making an error of 1 minute. If you make a, an error of 1 minute here, it gets directly transmitted to the job. But if you have a rotational device which is here and it is having if, if say 40 rotations of this is giving 1 rotation here, 1 minute error will be reduced by a factor of 40 when you come to the actual job. So, such a device is called uh, an indexing head, which converts a large amount of rotation to a very small amount of rotation by gears once again. So, we will end this lecture by having a quick look at such an indexing head. The indexing head basically consists of, this is the main working part of it. This is a worm, now you are quite conversant with the worm and the worm gear can be here up, can be here to the side etcetera. Let us draw it up. It has a warm gear connected to it, warm gear. What is the warm gear doing? This one has say 40 teeth, and this one is say k equal to 1. So, if I give 40 rotations here. this is going to give me one rotation only. So, if m is equal to 2 and z is equal to 72, okay, I have 40 rotations giving rise to one rotation. I have 1 by 70 second of a rotation which is required, this is required on the work piece. I am having the work piece here itself, work piece means the blank on which you are cutting gears. On the same shaft as that of the worm, it rotates with the worm, the work piece. So, 1 by second, 70 second of a rotation is required this is a symbol of rotations, 1 by 70 second of a rotation is required, 1 by 72 here in order to cut the next tooth. So, this will be obtained by 1 40, 1 by 72, 40 by 72, 40 by 72 rotations you give to the worm, uh, worm here by this particular handle and you will immediately have the job rotating by 1 by 72 rotations. Okay. So, with this we stop here, next day we will take up the details of milling.
to finish spur gear milling and after that use of differential indexing this is called simple indexing. We will take up differential indexing and after that we will take up uh, cutting of helical gears. Thank you very much. Thank you.